Hello, you're watching The Interview on France 24. I'm Europe editor Catherine Nicholson. Now, today, amid ever fiercer attacks by Russian forces on Ukraine, I'm speaking to the foreign minister of Latvia, a state which was under Soviet rule after World War II until 1991. It's been a NATO member since 2004. Edgar Zrinkevich, thank you very much for being on the programme. Thank you for having me. I'd like to start off with something that's been in the news uh, on the day that we're recording, Tuesday. Uh, the uh, president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, made an emotional appeal to the EU parliament, uh, asking the EU to support Ukraine formally starting on the path of EU membership. Now, I know that Latvia and seven other EU member states have already uh, called on the rest of the EU to immediately grant Ukraine EU candidate country status. Why is this so urgent in your view? Well, indeed, actually, Latvian government endorsed today the formal decision that we support Ukraine's membership in the EU and granting candidate status. I think that, of course, uh, we all understand that uh, actually it's quite long and very difficult process. But at this time, it is very important to send a very clear signal to those Ukrainians who are fighting for their independence and liberty that they are not alone and that they belong to Europe. And if that's their free choice, and I want to underline, if that's their free choice, mm -hmm. they are welcome to the European Union. You say it's a long and difficult process. Uh, what sort of timeline do you think could be realistic for Ukraine to actually join the EU? Well, it's a probably a very difficult question because I think that we all are currently um, supporting Ukraine in its fight against Russian aggression. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, if we really have political will, if Ukraine, when it, let's say, fends off all those uh, attacks that Russian military are currently conducting with the assistance from Belarus, and if they do uh, some reforms, then we can really try to do our best to do this uh, rather quickly. But I would be very careful to name any timelines at this point. And let's come back then to the situation on the ground inside Ukraine, changing quite quickly, of course. Uh, but we have seen a huge Russian military convoy approaching Kiev, cruise missile strikes in Kharkiv. Um, what do you believe Vladimir Putin is doing right now with these moves? Well, I think that he really wants to achieve his initial goal to have a regime change in Kiev, mm -hmm. uh, to install some kind of puppet government and then to try to negotiate, uh, let's say, neutrality, non-alignment, uh, and some kind of uh, very close partnership between Ukraine and Russia. But frankly, I think that each and every day of this fighting, especially now when uh, civilians are targeted, when civilians are killed, uh, is actually having an adverse effect, even if some cities are being taken. Even if some cities are being encircled, I think that also Ukrainian will to resist is also raising. And I do believe that with each and every day passing, this situation is unfortunately getting very difficult for civilians, but it's also getting rather complex for the Kremlin. You said you believe that Vladimir Putin wants regime change in Ukraine. Uh, Russia has such an enormous military and Vladimir Putin has not at this point used the full extent of his military possibilities. He, he could go a lot further, couldn't he? Do you believe that he, he could take over this country and try and install that puppet government? That's realistic. Well, I don't believe that you can occupy country size of Ukraine with that amount of military that Russia has its, at its uh, disposal. I don't believe. But at the same time, you can actually do your best uh, to inflict enough damage to the country, as I said, to try to install some kind of government in Kyiv, so that uh, this government is much friendlier to Russia. But I also believe that this is going to fail. Ukraine is a big country. There are very, I would say, different regions in that country. And I think that resistance is going to be there. And that mm -hmm. also it would be almost impossible uh, to, let's say, win over the hearts and minds of Ukrainians after what the Russians are doing. Because if uh, your relatives, if your friends, if your family members 
are killed by Russian bullets or, or missiles. I can't imagine how those people are going to accept uh, Russia now as their friend. I think that what we are seeing is actually a long-term effect, uh, especially when it comes to relations between Ukrainians and Russians. And I think that at this point, this is going to be very, very ugly future for uh, bilateral relations. Now, um, a big threat that Vladimir Putin seems to be making uh, is about relating to his nuclear arsenal. He put it on a heightened state of readiness, sending a, a strong signal to the West. Uh, we've spoken to uh, the Romanian foreign minister, Mr. Orescu, who said he doesn't, he's not convinced that this threat will be followed by the actual use of these nuclear weapons. Do you share his confidence? Well, I think that... Uh... There are a couple of elements we should take into account. First, this is not the first time when uh, President Putin was talking about uh, his nuclear forces. Remember that uh, some months after uh, capturing Crimea, he was talking that at that point he was also ready to heighten the alert of the nuclear forces if Ukrainians would resist or the West would come uh, to their uh, assistance. So I think that this is the kind of uh, methodology that if things are getting not so well for him, then of course he is threatening uh, nuclear forces. Number two, I think that it is precisely the kind of message to the publics, look, this land belongs to me, uh, hands off. The third is of course to stop all the assistance that currently European Union, the United Kingdom, the United States and Canada are providing to the Ukrainian armed forces. So I think that what we are seeing is that things are not going in accordance to the plan. Mm -hmm. Now, if that threat is uh, credible, well, I think that first of all, yes, that's blackmail. Uh, second of all, I do believe that we need to stand firm and probably one should remind also to Mr. Putin that NATO is nuclear alliance, that United States, France and the United Kingdom all three possess also the nuclear capabilities. And this is not the way how you can uh, work in this environment and you should not use the threat and you should not escalate. But I think that this is also the kind of strategy now. Escalate and then actually to de-escalate the situation. So uh, this is attempt to get Ukrainians, uh, let's say, uh, to lay down their arms. Mm -hmm. This is about the West to be, let's say, softer in that position. And let's also not forget that uh, it appears that even with all our warnings before 21st of February about huge economic cost of this invasion, possible invasion at that point, that uh, actually nobody in, in the Russian government, or at least the leadership of Russia, the president and his closest advisors believe that we are going to impose all those sanctions and more are to come. Well, indeed, I wanted to ask you about sanctions. Uh, but there is a lot of talk about new EU sanctions against Russia. Uh, what measures would you endorse? Well, I do believe one thing that we still need to do, and that's uh, the position of uh, my country, is that we need to impose the same sanctions on Belarus. Uh -huh. Disconnecting from SWIFT, because look, uh, first of all, Belarus is hosting Russian troops and from the territory of Belarus, uh, there have been missiles fired and also some Russian troop columns have been entering Ukraine. Second, uh, I do believe that uh, Russia can use Belarus to actually somehow uh, avoid some of those sanctions, especially Belarusian banks. So that's one thing. That's, that would have dual effect. Punish Belarus or to get Belarus cooperate with uh, the Western world in order to de-escalate. And second, of course, to build pressure on Russia. Then I think that we still have some possibilities if things are uh, moving into the let's say, wrong direction, uh, to look at the expanded list of uh, banks of Russia that should be disconnected from SWIFT. Some additional names. Uh, well, there are also some other positions we could look, the maritime sanctions and mm -hmm. so on and so on.
In terms of the sanctions on Russia, we have seen a, quite a huge impact already on the lives of ordinary uh, Russians uh, who've been uh, seen, of course, uh, you know, the, the ruble has taken a hit, people rushing to try and take their savings out of banks. There are those who say, uh, is the West really punishing Putin here or is the West punishing ordinary Russians? And could this be counterproductive? Well, I don't think it's counterproductive because uh, probably I will sound very harsh, but let me remind you that such actions as Russia currently is conducted and President Putin is in charge wouldn't be possible if a Russian public would disapprove. We have seen some of opinion polls showing that majority of Russians still think that Russia is doing the right thing. So from that point of view, I don't see any way how to dissuade Russia from further escalation as to inflict as much as possible economic cost. And then probably Russian people could ask themselves a couple of questions what their government is doing. And asking those questions in authoritarian regimes, uh, even if there is no free press, even if journalists cannot grill presidents, ministers, <clears throat> other high-level officials, but still, those regimes are closely following the mood change in the public. So, sorry, such kind of attack, actually brutal aggression against other country, means that we cannot actually say, oh, this is only Russian army and a couple of government officials responsible. This time, this is as it has been in the mm. 20th century with Germany, responsibility of the broader society. Edgar Zankiewicz, uh, thank you very much for being with us. That's all we've got time for right now. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And thanks to you as well for watching the interview. You can find all of our editions on our website, france24.com.